last minute and you didn't waver. I also want to thank you, Dion, for playing along. And we're excited to move right on. We'll be uh, highlighting nine to ten historical ladies from history, and then our very own uh, at the very end. Our first lady up will be Misty Copeland. American performer to be appointed as a principal dancer for American Ballet Theater. Misty was born October, September 10th of 1982 in Kansas City, Missouri. She endured a very prestigious home life to find her way to dance. Misty's background, like most of our women, was troubled. However, Mariah Carey, and eventually was chosen to be the captain of her dream of her drill team at her middle school. Copeland had very many uh, awards handed down through dance. This is where she found her passion. She would often slip away from problems and dance. Whatever your passion is, stick with it. In May of 2016. Copeland inspired a Barbie doll wearing a costume reminiscent of the one she wore in the movie Firebird. The doll is part of Barbie Sheroes program, which honors female heroes who break boundaries. Thank you, Mr. Copeland, for breaking boundaries. Next, we have Marion Anderson. Marion was born February 27, 1987, in Philadelphia. Marion displayed vocal talents as a child, but her family could not afford to pay for formal training. Members of her church congregated, raised funds for her to attend a musical school for a year. And in 1955, she became the first African-American singer to perform as a member of the Metropolitan Opera in New York City. Wow. Her performance at the Lincoln Memorial in 1939 helped set the stage for the Civil Rights era. The oldest of three girls, Anderson was just six years old when she became a choir member at the Union Baptist Church. This is where she earned her nickname, Baby Contra Alto. She told herself she had no money, and sometimes it just takes to want. By the late 1930s, she again honored the first African American ever to receive such an honor. We thank you for your passion. And it doesn't stop there. And notice the word first African American. Yes. And now we have a nurse, Mary Eliza Mahoney. Yes. It's okay. <laughs> Mary Eliza Mahoney yeah. was the first African American nurse to study and work professionally in the United States. She was also a co founder of the National Association of Colorado Graduate Nurses with Ooh. Ida B. Thomas. Ooh. Mahoney was born in Dorchester, Massachusetts in, 19, in 1845. Her exact date of birth is unknown. She was born to her parents with uh, two siblings who never had the interest in medicine. At age 33, 
Mahoney entered the 16-month nursing program at the New England Hospital for Women and Children. She exceeded 42 members in that class, making her the first African-American in history to earn professional nursing license. Wow. 10 years after her death, the NAGGN established the Mary Mahoney Award, which is given to women who contributed to racial integrations in nursing. We do see more of us in the hospitals as we go. Thank you for standing the course. <laughs> Civil rights is in full blown, full force. And our ladies are not silent. Dorothy Height. Woman, rights activists focused primarily on improving the circumstances of and opportunities for African American women. She was born in Virginia in 1912. Dorothy Height was a leader in addressing the rights of both women and African American as the president of the National Council of Negroes for Women. She was born on March 24th in Richmond, Virginia. She was a great speaker. She spoke with, she spoke loud and clear. She was known to assist in the monetary march, working closely with Martin Luther King Jr., A. Philip Randolph, Roy Wilkins, Whitney Young, John Lewis, and James Farmer. When we march today, ladies, we cannot we cannot overlook Dorothy Heights. She was also honored by President George Bush in 2004, and she became friends with our Barack Obama. We're so happy for Dorothy Heights, and we thank you for your contribution. African-American Congresswoman in 1968. Four years later, she became the first major party black candidates to make bid for the U.S. president. After initially being assigned to the House Forestry Committee, she shot many by demanding a reassignment. She was placed on the Veteran Affairs Committee, eventually graduated to the Education and Labor Committee. She did not join to clean the kitchen or mop the floors. That's right. She had a voice, yes. and we were going to hear it. Right. It is awesome and very proud to say that she did become part of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Yes. And we thank Chislam today, and we honor her forever. We're fighting. Florence Flo Kennedy. Yes. Several decades after the 1960 political upheavals, very few people recognize the name of the black feminist lawyer and activist Florence Flo Kennedy. Yes. Yes, when you think black power, when you think black Panthers, you have to think <laughs> Florence Flo Kennedy. <laughs> Kennedy started at born in 1916 in Kansas City, Missouri. She was raised by working class parents who taught their daughters to challenge white authority at every turn. In 1942, Kennedy moved from Kansas City to New York City where she found political direction for the lessons she had learned in the feet of her Lorna Cass parents. It is often that she would visit Oakland, California, 
There she became involved with the Black Panthers. Yes. She was never violent, but always stood her ground. We thank you for your fight, and we appreciate you. Florence Flo Kennedy. Yes. And now, we're still singing. Aretha Franklin, multiple Grammy winner and Queen of Soul. Aretha Franklin was known for such hits as Respect, Free Way of Love, and I Say a Little Prayer. In 1987, she became the first female artist to be introduced into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And in 2008, she won her 18th Grammy Award, Woo! making her one of the most honored artists in Grammy history. Yes. Aretha did many things. Uh, the adult behaviors that was introduced to her at an early age uh, caused many ups and downs. She never strayed away as she started her singing at church, and her last songs are believed to have been gospel. We thank you for the many years of entertainment, and we look forward to seeing you on the other side. Yeah. Coretta Scott King. All right, Miss King herself. Miss King herself. Miss, I have a dream, okay? Come on. Yes. also known Coretta Scott, was born April 27th of 1927. And we all know she was a stand by your man type woman. Right. Coretta Scott King was one of the most influential women leaders in our world. Prepared by her family, education, and personality for life, committed to social justice and peace. Born and raised in Marion, Alabama, Coretta Scott graduated valedictorian from Lincoln High School. She received a BA in music and education from Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio. After her husband's assassination in 1968, Ms. King founded and devoted great energy and commitment to building and developing programs for the Atlanta-based Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change as a living memorial to her husband, his life, and dreams. Correct, Scott. It's important to know your past, as you won't find your now until you've been through your past. And throughout each of these ladies, they all had one thing in common, and that was a passion. They found their purpose, and they lived to it. Today, we're going to share with you one of our very own. We call her Black History. Yes. Tina has willingly shared her own personal life story yes. up to this point. Born June 11, 1970, in Pasadena, California, at St. Luke Hospital, premature at seven months and barely one pound. Her mother would place her up for adoption. She would be adopted by a cousin of her mother, unbeknownst to them both, until they passed one another in the hallway as her birth mother was leaving the hospital. Raised in Sacramento, California by Carrie Louise and George Daniel Davis, she received what was the best a child could ask for, never wanting or needing for anything, strict, but what she would realize as she became an adult was that the strict was actually God's plan to have her prepared for what was coming. Her sister, her mother's only birthed child, 
were passed June of 1984 at the tender age of 42 of lupus. She saw a pain in her mother's eyes that she had never saw before. Tina would then give birth to her first child, Yvette Louise, <laughs> whom her mother named December of 84. This baby gave Tina's mother new life. However, shortly after death would invade their family again, Tina's daddy would pass July of 85. Although her parents enjoyed 30 years of marriage, her mother would pass shortly thereafter in August of 1986. 16 years old, a junior in high school, and a daughter to raise. However, God knew all this would occur. That is why she was adopted at birth. She would have everything instilled by the time her parents would pass. Christian foundation, importance of education, how to run a home, how to pay bills, to be a lady and have integrity. These are things we must teach our daughters. She would graduate on time with honors in June of 1988. Her oldest son was born August of 1988. She was soon married after it and would fall apart with the stepchild born outside of their marriage and her having another son in July of 1995. When she thought this marriage was mending, but things had not changed. After her divorce, still looking for love in all the wrong places, <laughs> she entered a relationship unequally yoked and again endured mental and physical abuse and would conceive yet another blessing, March of 2000, her baby boy. Based on the incidents in her life, most would think her destiny would be failure. But, yes. God but God had her in his hands. Yes. She used to often wonder where her life would have been if she had made different choices. Somebody say, don't look back. Hey. Don't look back. However, God says, stop looking at what it is and ask him what he wants it to be. Yes. You see, your current situation is not your final destination. Mm. Like he did it for Tina, I believe he'll do it for me. Amen. Some would think her daughter being a strong mother, her eldest son successful with a family of his own, her middle son an activist determined to improve his people, and the baby of the bunch working on an engineering degree would be all there is to remember to remember Tina for. But that's not all to her story. Yeah. They are just proof of what God can bring out of what we think is a terrible situation. Mm -hmm. Tina's still alive, so God's not done pruning away that which weighs her down. Pruning with his word and making what is good better. Therefore, what she would be remembered most by future generations has yet to be determined as she is still becoming. We're have each of the historic look, look back at your own life to see how you can make a difference. Can we give Sister Barbara Warren a hand clap, please? One twirl, right? Okay, right here. One twirl. One twirl. Okay. Come on. Woo! Give it up to us. Come on now. Give it up. One more twirl. One more twirl.
Why that why? That brings out Black History for the morning to a close. Again, I want to thank each of the participants. I do want to give a special shout out to Dion. I also want to take this opportunity to acknowledge three people that I've seen their progress out front, but I got a chance to watch them from the back room. I want to take this moment to acknowledge Deborah Mitchell, <laughs> Sister Marie Owens, that every child was marked and noted and it was just awesome to see that. So I really thank you. I also want to thank uh, Darcel for assisting me. Uh, it takes a village. Nothing successful is done by one person. So everybody that participated took a phone call, gave me a tip. Thank you so very much. And is there anyone want to share anything at this time? It's ironic, the program today. I, I didn't have that, uh, the Black History moment on my mind this morning. But coming to church, I went back in my life. Mm -hmm. I almost lost the steering wheel. Thanking the Lord for where he's brought me from. Yes. When I saw the presentation this morning, God is awesome. Yes, he is. I think about what he's brought me through. Dangerous things I was stupid at, you know, mm -hmm. just, just, just wrong. And he covered me. I, he had his hand on me all this time, all these years. And I'm so thankful. Thank you for this presentation. Anyone else?
black people, we're just as we're successful. And I'm just so glad to be here. <laughs> you know, and the program was, was good and you know, God is good. Amen. I just want to say I'm so proud of these young ladies um, and seasoned ladies. They came up and told their story in their own way. And my cousin Tina, that was a blessing to hear your story. I didn't, I've been knowing you, I feel like, all my life. And I didn't know a lot of those things. But so many of us have a story to tell. Right. And if we just open up and tell our story so that people can know where we came from, so they also know where we're trying to go. Um, when we look out and we look at everybody, our generation is not so removed that our parents or our, our grandparents had to, you know, go to colored only places and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was segregated. And they couldn't, you know, walk where they wanted to walk. And they couldn't eat where they wanted to eat. And they couldn't go where they wanted to go. So we gotta remember that. We haven't, we, we haven't, the struggle is not over. The struggle continues every single day. And now people are a little bit more subtle. Well, it used to be here in California, they said that racism was subtle, but now people come in, you know, showing you the real true colors. But you just gotta know who's you, who's you are, mm -hmm. always and stuff. God is good, and if it's for us, it's for us, and nobody Amen. can be in the That's way. Right. So. And we're gonna continue to do what we need to do because guess what? We black 365 days. Right? <laughs> This lady, not only the first lady, she's the only lady, black or white, that they retired. I mean, when Jean, Jean went me home, retired as a major general in the U.S. Air Force. Mm -hmm. She was born June 23, 1921, in Portland, Oregon. She died February 15, 2010, in Napa, Maryland. She, in the, in the Vietnam War, she worked on jet planes with other carriers. But she's the only one that rose to the Major General and, and retired. Two years after she retired, she became a two star general wow. in the Air Force. The only lady, black and white, had, had the country. So we never hear about it. You always hear about the white hero and the never heard of black one. Right, right, right. This is right. lady. She, she wrote this from a student high school, race pass, to become a major general in the U.S. Air Force. Wow, amazing. Along with the white folk. Thank you. today knowing that I was going to talk <laughs> at all <laughs> but um, I guess that I am here to talk about uh, what we have learned about history and where we are today um, y'all know me I kind of keep radical thoughts at all times um, <laughs> I am very critical when it comes to the system and when it comes to the society that we live in um, and personally I think that uh, of course, we definitely we have made progress in everything. Uh, extremely humble, you know, to uh, to hear the stories of our ancestors, uh, to hear the stories of our elders, um, to feel the pain of our elders, you know, uh, just being in the space and everything, just the energy that's in the room right now, uh, extremely heavy, you know. I definitely feel like our ancestors are here with us. Um, but like I said, getting back to the radical thoughts, um, I like to think that uh, we are still essentially living in the same system. Uh, to make things a little bit more relatable for my young folks, um, it's kind of like when you get that PlayStation 4, and you got that PlayStation 4 and it's the same system, right? But you got Call of Duty on it, you got NBA 2K, you got Madden, you got all these different games and everything, but it's still the same system that you're playing, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, a lot of times people like to think that we live in a post-racial society um, when racism is, is no longer a thing, just like how my cousin Neon was saying, you know, especially here in California, we think that we have like this, this incredibly super liberal society. But um, in reality though, when you follow history and you follow the way that our community has been treated in America, 
just like I said, you know, it's the same system, it's just different games. So it went from us being directly linked to us now being uh, killed by the police, you know, at will, free will. Yeah. And a lot of the times whenever situations like this come up, the first thing that comes up when it's a black person that's killed is we look for the justification as to the reason why they were killed instead of looking for the humanity and, um, and the life that these people lived, you know, while they were here right, with us, right? right? right, right. So a lot of the times historically, um, it was thought that we as a people didn't really feel pain, you know? So that was the reason why we were always subject, you know, to all these different um, health tests, you know, uh, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of different science experiments, different things that were projected on us and everything. Um, and it was because at that point in time, we weren't looked at as human. And I like to say that today, we are still not looked at as human because whenever we do get killed in these streets or whatever the case may be, or whenever there is a situation, you know, when we are attacked in society, it, it's looked at as what are the things that that person could have done to bring that upon themselves. Mm -hmm. But when there's other communities that are being examined, though, it's, oh, he was alone. Even, even, even when we're talking about massacres now, yeah. you have to think about that. Even when we're talking about massacres, yeah. it's, oh, he was a lone wolf and, oh, mental health and all these other things. that yes. black people don't go through all of these things. Mm -hmm. So I definitely encourage us all as a community um, to definitely, uh, to really look deep into our history, um, our elders, you all have lived it, and there's nothing that I can say, you know, to, to, to remove that pain, to remove that hurt, except the fact that, you know, like, y'all legacy is definitely not going, um, you know, unwarranted. Y'all definitely have people that are still uh, continuing on with the fight of liberation and everything, and I am extremely thankful and extremely humble to be able to keep, uh, continue on that fight. And I just thank all of the elders that are in here and I'm extremely thankful for all of our ancestors. And all of us should definitely be making sure that we're giving acknowledgements to all of our ancestors and all of our elders, you know, cause just like my cousin Dion was saying, we're black 365 days a year. There are attacks on our community 365 days a year. So we have to follow it because there are a lot of things that we still have to do in order to fight for our liberation. For my young folks, our elders have already done their part of the work. So it's up for us. Now time for us to go ahead and bring up the torch and yes. continue on with the work. And I see that y'all are doing that, and I'm extremely proud of y'all for doing that. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you. Happy Black History Month.
lot of stuff that we don't know about that we don't teach our kids. But we haven't always been true to ourselves. Tell them the truth. Back in the day, black men, black women, black men, if, if, the, if the woman had dark skin, she, she wasn't in the game. If she was light skin, now she's all right. We did. We, uh, that's the way that we treat, treated our, ourselves. We did things to ourselves sometimes. Can't blame the white man for everything that we did. We did some things to ourselves. Yeah. And we still do it to our young women. Exploits them. John and I were talking pretty, pretty day about R. Kelly, 50 mm -hmm. years, been in school, doing the same thing for 20 years. Mm -hmm. He might get some time. Mm -hmm. Same thing for 20 years, exploiting young people. So, brothers, young brothers, be careful how we treat our sisters. Mm -hmm. And young sisters, be careful how you carry yourself. Yes. In the churches, we have mothers and deaconess that try to teach the young women how to carry themselves. Say they have a deacon, pastor, try to, try to teach young men. And I would give Donovan 100% on the test. The young man is strong, he's yes. smart. Yes. Yes. He's got his eye on the prize mm -hmm. <laughs> moving forward. He said sometimes he gets his right to move these things in his mind. <laughs> we all do that. We all do that. Get ready to throw up our deuce on something in the fight. But I said, black people keep on moving on, keep on moving on. And as we grow older, we have to set an example for those behind us. Because they're looking at us. And Donald is my buddy, I love that dude. <laughs> Say good morning. Good morning. I just want to say this about the journey that God had placed me on. Born in Birmingham, Alabama, raised up in Selma. This is where I. Uh, about 15, 14, 15 years old, I got to meet Dr. King wow. at the Brown Chapter Baptist Church. We started from there. We marched from there to the Peddler's Bridge the first time. Cool. Come back to the church. Then the next time, we we're going to go across the bridge. We went across the bridge. It was cool. Then they say that we didn't have a permit for all of the peoples that was on the bridge. So they had to go and get a permit. <coughs> um, going, going from Brown Chapel, uh, uh, Dr. King bringing the message, preaching. I got to shake his hand at the door the same way that pastor do. Standing at the door. That's when it seemed like to me that the Holy Spirit hit me. This man was everything in my life. I would do anything for him. I would go anywhere with him. That's when I realized that that some walk with me, Lord. Yes. Hold my hand. Yes. That was in my heart because we really needed the Lord. Cause we out there with no protection. I always been, I was sort of raised about three or four years out in the country with my grandparents and I always had a knife. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. And this way I couldn't carry the knife with me cause we were going in and out of the church. And uh, I thought that was something, you know, that a person, you know, shouldn't do. And then it's nonviolent too. So I didn't know what the devil was going to do through me and what the spirit was going to do through me. Yeah. But I know I had to honor mm -hmm. Dr. King. Yeah. Is he said nonviolent? Nonviolent. We'll go to the uh, stores downtown Broadway. And uh, we have been through training how to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, you ball up in a knot. 
let the people kick you, drag you out of the store, onto the sidewalk. Either you get up and run with the group. <laughs> You know, it, it, was, it, was, it was sad. It was a sad time for me, but by being young, I, I didn't care. I didn't have no fear. I didn't know. I didn't know the fear of, of getting shot, uh, 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 or losing an eye, or dying. You know, people just getting, they getting burned up in churches, and little girls, and all this stuff. They stopping people on the street. I moved from, from Selma to Summerfield. It's three miles outside of town. And uh, on my way home, there's two ways to get there. On my way home, the Ku Klux Klan mm. is at the fork of the road. Whoa. They are in, they, 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 they got a big fire going with a cross burning. And I realized that this is what's going on. So I said, hey, I'm turning around. That's right. I hear this voice, you know, turn around. Yes. And I start making, it just a two, two lane little highway. I start turning around and I can hear something going across. <coughs> zoom, zoom. I said, oh man, them just was shooting at me already. <laughs> so I had about, well, five miles, something like that. Ten miles. I had to turn around and go all the way back around, go to the other highway to get home. Mm, wow. I'm going to tell you the truth about this march for me. I went part of the way because I had this good job. And I didn't want to lose my job. I was making 98 cents an hour. Oh. I said, you know. Um, <laughs> And we already been pre-warned about it. If you be in that march, if you have anything to do with it, don't come back to work. You know, mm -hmm. if your picture is on TV, don't come back to work and all that stuff. So we was mostly running around with them at night. <laughs> we was, we we marched we marched we marched about halfway from Selma to Montgomery, 52 <laughs> miles. We would go we would go. Uh, maybe 15 miles with him, and then we had to go back. We'd turn around and go back. <clears throat> going that night, going that night where they was camped out for half of the way, the highway patrolman pulled us over and said, where you boys are going? Said, well, we have to go to Montgomery today. We are going to see some people about a job. Lord forgive us, cause we we was lying, cause we was, <laughs> these was our co-workers that we were working with. So the highway patrolman said, "Well, not today. You guys gonna have to wait until next week to go." So, so why? What's what's you know what's going on? He said, "Well, you got a broken tail light." Oh. And this is Millhouse car, and I know he keeps this car clean. So. The highway patrolman walked around to the back of the car and kicked out the tail light. Wow. Oh, man. So we turn around, get on the other side, head back to Selma. But it always been a side street. Even I see it here, out here in California. It always a side street or the first street that was made before the highway. So we went down by five miles and went over on that side street and went through the woods just to get to Montgomery, mm -hmm. where they, you know, where they was camped out at. Ben Cartwright, Joe, all them guys, the whole Cartwright family and stuff, they was one of the guests for them, the speaker. There's people come out of New York, out of California and all that to help out, you know, to help support. The, the money thing, the food, and, and the sodas and stuff that were brought in to help feed these people that and that. And it was, it, I, 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 I just can't thank God enough mm -hmm. for the protection and stuff, yes. you know. They used to sit at the Pebbles Bridge 
waiting on Dr. King. I'm talking about they had somebody there like it was a bank and, and, and uh, trying to get him before he get into town. Even myself, for a minute, I didn't know how he was getting in town. Mm -hmm. And then one day, we always told him, say, if you see anybody sitting on the street in front of the church, find out who they is. Go up and ask them, you know. That's what I'm talking. This is where some of the cars got turned over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two or three guys would grab the side of the car and flip it over if they didn't move because they was trying to find out too how Dr. King was getting into town. Mm. And I found out that he was in the trunk of the car. Wow. Yeah. Mm. I don't know when he got in there, <laughs> or how close to town, but that's where he was, in the trunk of the car and stuff like that. They, they would pull up, back up in the, inside of the church, let him out. He'd go through the back side door and go in the church. Mm. Wow. To God be the glory for all the protection and yes. the peoples and mm -hmm. the people that lost their lives for us in that, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. you know, that God be glorified. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Come on, let's give them all a hand. Let's give them all a hand. African-American history. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So you, that's the reason why it's finally important that seasoned people talk to young people to let them know exactly what they've been through in their life. Yeah. Because the fact is the struggle is real. Yeah. And we're still dealing with it even on another, they just do it, hold on, Sister Chair, hold on, hold on. Oh, okay. uh, they're still doing it on another level. Mm -hmm. They're still, they still right. lynching us. But they lynch us on another level. Right? So we have to be cautious of the fact, and it's very important as parents that you go to the school and find out what's going on at the school. That's right. It's very important to make sure your number is right at the school. That's right. Because if something was to happen, we don't know how to get in touch with you. We don't know what to do. Everybody with me? So it's very important that, that the we as, uh, I don't know what would I be? What, would I, what, what generation would I be? Jerk. <laughs> 53 and 3. Are you um, a baby boomer? 54. I'm 53. Aren't you a baby boomer? Oh, John is a baby boomer. I'm a homie. I'm a homie from the hood. Yeah. Right? So it's very important that we really do not, uh, because what we did was we lost a generation of people. Either that's either through crack, some other, or some other ways, they've eliminated. And then what we've done is, my generation is kind of like rebellious against church. Mm -hmm. We don't want to hear what you got to say. But the struggle is still real. And so what we have to do is let, put down our barriers and tell your story. You got to take down your barriers and tell your story and let them know that the struggle is really real. Amen? And so uh, real, real quickly, we have the first African-American bus driver for RT. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Come on, let's give him a hand. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, y'all. Come on, come on. Amen. Thank God for Brother Nelson. Amen. Uh, Brother Nelson even let me ride the bus free a couple times. Didn't even know who I was. Get on the bus. That's when he had the old raggedy bus. They were going down Stockton Boulevard. And uh, get on the bus. So we thank God. And I just need to touch your neighbor to tell him, tell him to get on the bus. Get on the bus. It, it is an amazing really real quickly how uh, our pair our four parents struggle to get off the back of the bus mm -hmm. but yet still when we pay our little money to get on the bus where do we go that part but we have but we have a back of the bus mentality okay. no I can drive that bus I, I can drive that bus. I don't have to be at the back of the bus. No. So what we have to do is rise above whatever we're going through. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, Yaya sent me, asked me to write her a letter. Yasmir asked me to write a letter for the Gator program. 
We don't have to be at the back of the bus. We can be in the gate program. Right. We can be in the avid program. We can do whatever God has called us to be. Yeah. But we as senior people, senior saints, we need to push them instead of pull them down. That's right. We need to push them instead of pulling them down. Because all of us know we got some struggle. All of us got some stuff we've been through in our life. We have not been on the fourth floor of heaven all of our life. It's real. Amen? It's offering time. It's offering time. <laughs> white person, 
But that's exactly what it was, an idea. God has placed this mission on our heart to show the black community that we are not who the whites say we are, yes. but what God says we are. Yes. She stood up because everyone else sat down. Mm -hmm. She was not afraid of the snares that the devil placed in her life well, yeah. because she knew that God was with her. You, and although we are a permanently black church, we know that there is only one race, yes. and that's the human race. Yes. Yes. Well done. Broadway and Oak Park be completely transformed, and we've recruited several nonprofits such as City Year and Valley Vision uh, to uh, to our neighborhood, and also created employment opportunities for our scholars, so they can have access to real work ex work experiences and prepare them for college. Um, our tuition free college prep schools, uh, serving kindergarten through 12th grades, including Sacramento Charter High School. PS7 Elementary School and PS7 Middle School are some of the top performing schools here in Sacramento. And it's taken years of dedication to the community and our scholars, but we're so proud to share the work and a few, a few highlights that we have uh, come to share with you today. And I'm going to rightly share what some of those accomplishments are. Thank you, everybody. So a few, a couple of exciting things that we have going on at St. Hill Public Schools. One is this is the first year that our schools have qualified for a universal free lunch. That means every single scholar that comes to school. The second is we're going to begin construction for a brand new facility at our elementary school. Our kindergarten through fifth graders are going to be on a brand new site as we were awarded a $25 million grant. <laughs> Third is that last year through Big Day of Giving and through the generous um, folks that have partnered with us, we raised sixty-five thousand dollars right. to create a new library for us. Right. Last year, we're excited to announce that ninety-five percent of Sac High seniors were accepted to four-year colleges. to tell you that this is the first year ever that our elementary scholars are receiving music, art, and PE. That's not oh, very good. Yeah. Yeah. And lastly, I also want to tell you that every single scholar, TK through 12th grade, goes on a college field trip at St. Hope Public School. Every yeah. school. Um, so some of the things that we're doing to celebrate this year's 30th anniversary in Oak Park is when we have a speaker series at Underground Books. For those who haven't visited Underground Books, it's one of the last remaining African American bookstores in the nation. And we have it right here in Sacramento. And so one of the things that they have is a speaker series. And so over the summer, we bring in speakers from all across the country, um, prominent African Americans, to share their, their wisdom and knowledge with us here in Sacramento. Yeah. Uh, one of the other things that will be happening is we have several cultural uh, events and book signings um, at the bookstore. In addition, we will ha be having a huge block party on April 18th, okay. so hoping that everyone here can come and join us. That will be on the corner of 34th Street and Broadway. Um, during that time, we'll also be hosting our lottery night. So for all of the students who have applied to the St. Hope schools, they'll be finding out if their acceptances into the schools uh, were, were received on that evening as well. So again, that's uh, Thursday, April 18th from 4 until 7, and we hope that you all come out for that. Um, so not only do we want to invite you to these events, but we're also here uh, in honor of your presence today um, to thank you 
Um, as part of that, we have identified uh, 30 churches in the neighborhood who have been great, of great support to us at St. Hope. Uh, and we were, we're presenting them all with a contribution of a $500 donation. With this contribution now, I'd like to do this. And that is, we're going to give this to the youth minister. Come on, come on, come on. All the youth, all the youth, come on, come on, come on. All you, y'all come on up the back row. Come on. Come on, get up, get up, get up, get up the corner. Come on, uh, ladies. Ladies, here's the lighters.